Thank you. Do we have the mic? We're good? Can you hear me? Yeah, OK, great. Thank you. Um, so I have a talk today that I wanted to, to give you, and I call it Checking as a Service. And it's about how um, my thinking has kind of evolved recently to think about how um, some of the traditional ways we've thought about testing uh, kind of have changed with some of the recent changes in, in technology and how an architecture uh, and so forth. So um, we'll tell you first a little bit about myself. I work uh, for HomeAway. HomeAway is recently acquired by Expedia, so I'm part of the Expedia family now. And I work as a test architect where I develop strategies for GUI, API, integration testing, all types of automation, uh, including uh, Selenium. We're big users of uh, Water WebDriver. I've been doing automated testing for over 20 years. Um, I started working with a lot of the commercial tools. I've worked for several of the tool vendors years ago. Uh, I started publishing uh, criticisms of uh, the commercial tools and what I thought was lacking in them. And when I felt like those needs weren't being addressed, I started getting involved in open source. Uh, and that's what brought me to, uh, to get involved with the Selenium project. That was when I was at ThoughtWorks. That was in 2004 as well, when, when, I, when I met Naresh. Um, and at that point, we launched the, the Water Project, which was something I did. And then the Selenium, uh, the initial release of Selenium that was uh, sponsored by ThoughtWorks, I helped get that sponsored and uh, released and open sourced. I think that was one of the first things that was officially open sourced from ThoughtWorks. And that was still when it was a new strategy. Now you see a lot of companies with open source strategies, but it was a new thing back then. Before that, in 2001, I, had, I co wrote a book called Lessons Learned in Software Testing. And some of you uh, may have read that. Um, and then, you know, with time, uh, the, the water project, which I've been working on, the Selenium project, were kind of on parallel tracks. And we brought them together in 2009. Uh, Yari Bakken did that uh, implementation. And so that was the water API, which is a Ruby API that ran uh, with the web driver backend. So uh, that's what I've been using since then as my primary GUI automation driver. Uh, I also wanted to mention that I have a background in a degree in philosophy and mathematics, and that may show up in some of the way I've been thinking, because so much of what my uh, career really has been has been to look at how can we do a better job of automated testing? How can, you know, looking at what's happening, and, uh, and I see where, and so I've been thinking systematically about this kind of thing for over 20 years. So I wanted to start uh, with this paper. This is a ThoughtWorks paper that was recently published that uh, I thought was very good. Um, and the title's in the bottom. You can find it if you want to read it. And this graphic comes from that talk. The, the basic premise of this paper is that 10 years ago, this was the type of application that, that many of us were working with and developing, testing. Um, and so you had a, a browser hooked up to, a, uh, to an app server. It, um, and this one here is, is uh, you know, could be Java or .NET. And then you've got SQL behind it and some kind of reporting service. And that was a fairly uh, traditional, in fact, you know, that really had architectures 10 years before that weren't much different. The main difference that had happened in that time was moving things onto the web. But the back ends were still fairly similar. Also, a lot of the applications back then were still software as a product. That's what I was working with. And this was to say that, that we would develop the software, um, and then we would release it to the customers who would install it on their, on their site. And so with software as a product, in, you know, in QA, you would take it, you would, you would test it, you would say, yeah, it's good, and then it would get shipped out. So it was still the traditional type of shipping uh, system that you had where you uh, had a fairly long uh, development process. And it was fairly uh, important that you get it right, because you didn't, you just, you, you wanted to have QA involved. You wanted to make sure, because reshipping was an expensive and kind of difficult task uh, to work on. Um, and you know what I've seen in, in my work is, is I certainly have moved along uh, from, from this type of architecture to this is much more uh, aligned with what I'm working on nowadays at, at HomeAway, and I think what a lot of people are, is 
let me just get like a show of hands. Who 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 feels like this is something that they're seeing as well, moving from this type of simplicity to something? Here we have the microservices, uh, multiple uh, front ends to it. Yeah. Does anyone else have this kind of? Okay. So some of you have been seeing this kind of change too, right? And this is a lot of complexity here because this was. This was stuff where I could just kind of install it myself. I could get it. I could update the SQL. I'd drop in the new, um, the, the, new app, the, the, the new Java code or whatever. And here we have uh, microservices. We've got different data stores coming behind it. We've got queuing services. There's uh, a data lake. Um, and then there's various analytics engines running off that data lake, right? So, so that to me is a more typical architecture, uh, both for what I've been doing in my day-to-day -day work, but also I think what a lot of other people are. So I wanted to say that because because to me that's the situation we're in, and and you know the the big challenge to this type of change, right, is this that we have that we're releasing more frequently. Uh, at my company now, we are regularly have components that are released every week. Uh, every two weeks, and we're being pushed to go much further than that, and to start going to daily releases. So, how do you how do you do your automation? How do you do your QA when you have that very very rapid turnaround? That to me is the challenge that uh, that we're facing today. So, the traditional approach for how you kind of divide up the QA roles uh, that I've seen is you've got the manual testers, and then you've got the the automators, right? The people who are developing the tests. And developing the scripts, and when I've been, I, I've been doing this for for a long, long time, and I always thought this was great because, you know, with a manual tester, you're just you're doing testing, right? So what's the output of manual testing? It's it's the bug reports, it's a coverage report, it's uh, you know you do some planning in advance, um, but the point here is the testing only happens if if the tester's around, right? And the whole what's great about automation is you don't is you can write the tests and then anybody can run them, right? And so you don't have to be tied to have a single person. So there, there's a new, oh, there's a new release now. We need someone to test it. And that's part of the job of management, right, is to figure out how do I line up the resources I need in order to get the testing this done so we can keep on that schedule. And uh, with manual testing, you've got a certain amount of time you need. You need to make sure you have the right people. You need to make sure that, OK, I won't worry. Um, thank you. So, so that's uh, that's to me why I thought this this is what made me really fall in love with automation. I've been doing, like I said, automation for a long time. Um, but what I've seen a lot of times is we really get something more like this, where uh, where ideally anyone can run the test, ideally anyone can figure out what's going on. But I've seen in many cases where. The tests run automatically. They might run overnight in a CI system. And then in the morning, it's the job of the, the test developers to say, you, they're like, well, you need to go look through the result and figure out if there's any bugs in it. That there's a lot of false alarms, a lot of, there's a lot of red in there, and you have to you sort it out. Does anyone see, have this kind of challenge? OK. So, so this is something I see too, right? And I see this as part of what I'm trying to work with my teams, is how do we, how do we get out of this? This is what I call uh, lately manual automated testing. This is automated testing that still requires uh, a, a, an automator to get involved to, to look at what's coming out. And it's still better than the manual testing in the sense that you could get a lot more coverage faster. You can get a full run in the night. And then in the morning, you come in and you figure out what's, what's right and wrong, right? And you can, and, you know, and if you, it's, it's better than having to do all that manually. But, but I think like from a manager's perspective, because I've been both roles, um, it's kind of frustrating because you're like, OK, well, you know, then you come in and you're like, well, what, what do we have? And how long does it take? And what happens when your automators go on vacation, right? And that's, uh, that's been a challenge for us this summer, right? Summertime, and people are away. And then, OK, well, the guy who wrote the test suite, he's on vacation. We can run his test because he's not here. But you know, it's red, and we don't know if these errors are real errors or fake errors or something we've seen before or new. And that takes time. And you need someone who's familiar with the tests. And, and it can get tricky for the, for, the, for the manager in that situation, right? Because not only do we need, uh, uh, you know, with a manual tester, you need to have someone who do the product. Now we need someone who knows the test suite, right? So that's even a, a, a more narrow thing. So that's kind of the situation we're in and, and that I'm in and that I think a lot of people are in. 
And I've been thinking, and, and there's a several different ideas, new ideas that I've been really thinking through that I think should give us some leverage to change the situation. That's what I want to go through here. So the first thing I want to talk about is this distinction between testing versus checking. Has anyone heard, heard about this before? Yeah? So can someone tell me what, what you think that means? What's the difference? I don't know if we can, yeah. Right, so he's, he said, um, you know, with the manual, it's more of manual exploratory. And what was checking, would you say? Right, so it's looking for, think, for your expectations. Do you have an you have idea of what you expect and, and do you find it? Any other ideas about what the difference of these are? Does that sound right? Yeah, so this, this is how, this is the words that I, I put together for it. Um, I, I actually, when it first came out, I was like, this is kind of a silly distinction. And uh, that was what I thought at first, but I was thinking, you know, this is actually interesting because I, I think this distinction was first put in place as a way of focusing on testing and on manual testing and all the things that are involved so we didn't undersell the manual testing. But I realized that, that, that checking is actually really what, um, is what we want with automation, right? And, but with that manual automated testing, we're not really getting checking. We're still getting testing with that. Uh, and so that's kind of what I've been pushing lately on, on the automation is let's get, do we have checking? Do we know, uh, do, we, do we know right away whether there's, a, whether there's an issue or not there and what the issue is? Another thing that I think about even behind this is, is A-B testing. Um, who does A-B testing? I, I know we've had some talks about that yesterday. So with A-B testing, we have, um, you know, and, and I, I think a lot of QA people are like, well, what's, what's our role in A-B testing? Should we be involved? Are we doing that? Um, and, and I feel like part of that testing idea of exploring, you know, what I put here is exploring a product that's fit for use, that's what A-B testing is doing. And so testing is kind of coming out of QA. It's coming out of of that role, and now it's something that the whole team is embracing. And I think this is really good. I remember uh, 15 years ago that um, a lot of QA folks were saying, you know, why are we the only ones that care about testing? Why are the only ones caring about quality, right? And now what I see is teams being organized around testing, saying, how are we going to test this? How do we know uh, if, this is, if this is good or not? I used to be someone who would report usability bugs. I would say, Oh, this is hard to use, or whatever, whatever, whatever. And I was good at it, and I, it was an important part of my job, especially in that old, uh, you know, software is a product thing where it's going to get shipped out. It's hard to send updates. We want something that, that people can use. But with A-B testing and with, with, with a software, which is delivered as software as a service so you can deploy more frequently, it becomes easier for the whole team to take charge of the testing. And so it seems to me, because of this, that the QA role or the the dedicated kind of focus needs to be more on the checking because we've got other people looking at the testing of the, of the whole thing here. So the other thing that um, that I've noticed is is a change in focus, and this took me a longer time to really sink in. But when we're focusing more on APIs uh, and services instead of libraries, for a long time. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I wrote code and I developed test code. I developed the test libraries. The tests themselves were a type of a, um, a library. And, you know, I was focusing on delivering that, saying make sure my code is good, the people who can, want to use the code can use it. But when we think of, of, of the focus on APIs and services, then, um, in particular, the reliability of the system now becomes our responsibility, right? We have to think about not just is the code itself good, but how is it being deployed, how is it being run, how is it being supported? And I realized that we could say the same thing about our tests, right? And instead of thinking of our tests as just artifacts, as, as things that are there that anybody can use or that can be run, we see these as things that are happening and things that need to be supported and, 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 and developed. And the, 
the other thing that I've been spending a lot of time lately is learning about DevOps, um, learning about Docker, learning about uh, the technologies that help us uh, support um, automated deployments, really, is what this is about, and about uh, pulling the roles uh, between QA, uh, between the, the dev and the ops together. So I, I feel like part of what um, the QA role used to be was that we would protect the ops team from the developers. So, uh, so the so the 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 ops team, and they were often, they would want to make sure, because they didn't want, uh, right, they're responsible for the reliability of the service, right, they, of, of the product. And they knew, they statistically, I think about a quarter in general of, of issues in production are caused by the introduction of new software. That's a, just a general number that I've seen uh, in different places. And so they want to make sure that this new software that's being deployed isn't buggy, right? And so they are counting on the QA team to go through and say, yeah, this is good. This is ready for deployment. And so the QA team was kind of the middleman there, in many cases, or the gatekeeper, right, between the dev and the ops. And I think what DevOps is all is about is about short-circuiting that and saying, okay, we're going to have the developers working directly with the ops folks for the DevOps. And we're going to build the, it's both a set of tools and, and technologies, uh, containerization. But it's also a different practice, right? And it's a different sense of ownership where instead of saying, well, I am responsible for the bits and, and for the code, and you figure out how to deploy it and manage it, um, it's like that becomes a team responsibility. We have to work together to make sure the whole thing uh, can work well. So this is, this is the, uh, this is, this is the who's, who's doing this kind of DevOps? Is this a, okay. So not a lot of, I don't see a lot of hands on this one here. Um, but this is definitely something that, that, that I'm seeing. Uh, and, 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 you know, I work, I work, I'm from Austin and uh, Texas, and so I work not only at home away, but I, I talk to a lot of my friends in the town, and, and this is something that, that we've seen there as well. So, so those are some ideas, and I got these ideas together. I'm thinking, okay, how does this change how we think about QA and what our roles are and how we set our priorities? And what it, years ago I was uh, put on a team uh, solo, I was, it was kind of a funny situation, and there was kind of a corporate shuffle, and I had been brought in to coach a bunch of people uh, and help develop kind of, I was an automation lead, I've been doing automation for a long time, so that's usually what companies hire me to do. Um, but because of the way a bunch of things moved around, I became kind of the, I became the sole QA on a project, and it was kind of an internal startup, and so it was a it was exciting, and uh, I had to do a lot of different roles, and I was much more, instead of, I had a much broader sense of responsibilities. I had to not only write the automation, but run it, write the bug reports, figure out what the test plan was. And, and I even did, was going outside of the QA role uh, because it was such a small team, and we had, you know, we had this new product we had to launch. And so I had this, this sticky note uh, that I put, put on, my, on my desk, is what's the business value of what I'm doing today? And that was something that I thought about every day. What am I, what am I doing that's valuable to the business, right? Because it's very easy to get into a rut of saying, okay, it's my job to make sure all of these regression tests are, are passing, right? But what's the value of that? What's the value of the things we're doing? How is that meaningful to the business? Um, and I'll tell another story here. So. Uh, at another job, again, I was hired, this is a different one from that one, where I was brought in and they said, okay, you're a, you're a Selenium expert, you, you know a lot about automation, we want a lot of automation. They, uh, they interviewed me for the job and I talked to all these folks for that. And, uh, and so I came in and, and even though I was, I was hired to do the automation, um, this was about eight years ago and I, Agile was still pretty new, and so I was kind of I was, I was doing a lot of Agile coaching. I had been, like Naresh said, I'd been with ThoughtWorks. I'd seen a lot of effective Agile teams, and that was a time when it was still pretty new uh, in a lot of places. So I was doing a lot of Agile coaching, and again, I was trying to be helpful in whatever way I could. Uh, but then there was a point where I was like, you know, I really wanted to do the automation. That's still kind of in my heart what I like to do and it, what makes me feel good, right? So, uh, so there was a certain point where I said, can I just really really focused on that. I'd like to get these tests running. And uh, I remember I, I had a particular conversation with an executive there who had been 
think he was kind of the, the one who had, uh, you know, sponsored my hiring when I came in, signed off on it, and I talked to him briefly. Uh, and I, that's why I told him. I said, well, you know, you've got me doing all these different things, and uh, I was doing audits on things and trying to make sure we had good quality software. Uh, but I said, you know, I'd really like to focus on the, the automation role that I was that I was hired to do. And he said to me, he said, don't rewrite history. And I thought that was, and that was an interesting comment, right? Because I thought, oh, okay, well, that was, and I realized then that there was conversations that had happened when they'd hired me that I hadn't been a part of, right? Because, and this, this is true for all of us, is if whatever we're doing, you know, we're, we're being paid out of a certain budget, and that budget is uh, being justified at an executive level for certain reasons. And I, I realized, you know, I was really being paid out of a QA budget, which is really a risk management budget in many ways, right? The, at a certain level, um, people aren't saying, oh, we want more testing because testing is good. What they're saying is we want fewer bugs, we want fewer support calls, we want fewer customer complaints. Right? And the generally the belief is, okay, well, we'll get better testing, and that's what it'll give us too. So, so, uh, so it's a, really a risk management thing. And so it got me thinking more about, okay, what is the value? What is this really doing here? Because if the automation isn't leading to these things, then uh, the, those. And so that's why I started, and I really wanted to know what, you know, what does the money want? This is something, this is the phrase I came up with because, um, Sorry, I'm not used to having paparazzi. <laughs> uh, yeah, what? <laughs> uh, what's what's like? And, and, I, and I see this financially right now too. You know, I, I, this was, you know, when we see these economic uh, events and how they change things, and you try to figure out, well, what is what is driving? You know, uh, it's not even me and the executives, but like. How is my company getting the money? And how's, how's this all coming through, right? There's a there's an expectation I realize that money has around what it's getting. And, and that's what I found a, a good way to think about this. So this is where I feel like this needs to go and to say that we need to start thinking about checking as a service. And so we need to focus less on testing and more on checking on how, because that's, I think, is what the money wants. The money wants us, this is, and this is really what I think was originally sold, right? When we, they came in, they said, well, you know, we want, we want these automated tests, and I think what they were asking us for was checking, was we want an automatic way that any developer or anyone in the company can know whether the code is good or bad with a very quick turnaround, right? And what, what we gave them here, what, what, what this is here, right, this is, this is really your manual automated testing. That's kind of what we gave them instead. And, and so this is a phrase my friend Mark came up with, uh, a Ruby tester, uh, the check ops engineer. What, how can we come in and think of checking as a service? How can we come in and just say, we will make sure that we can give you that, that reliable up, thumbs up, or thumbs down about whether things are going as much as possible. Um, and so that makes me think of this now as checking as a service. Now, in a more traditional role, when I was thinking of myself as a test developer and as someone who is creating tests and, and adding to the test suite, I was generally focused on coverage. And I think that's how a lot of people think about this as well. They say, okay, how many tests do we have? We start counting our test cases. We say, you know, how many of our scenarios are covered? How many uh, of those do we have? And uh, what I found uh, on some of my projects was I run people's tests, I look at their test suites, and I say, well, it's, 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 never, it's never running green. Like, how, how, how come it's, you know, and I'd look at the test suites, and they'd be, oh, yeah, well, those tests, those, those, those fail a lot. We see that problem a lot. Or um, uh, this is one that, that gets my goat is I'll say, well, what's the issue here? And then someone will say, well, there's a timing issue. Like, like that's an answer. Like that means something. And all it means is another way of saying I don't know or we're confused or whatever, right? Because, um, and so, you know, when, when you're focused on coverage, well, how reliable are your tests? How often do your tests 
correctly report defects and how often do they give us false alarms. And I realize we need to start thinking again like the tests as a service. As we think of them as a check ops engineer, we say what's the reliability of our service? Operations, you're always looking at what's the reliability numbers, right? You're, you're, you're measuring them. What's your uptime? How often is it correct? And yet I hadn't seen that kind of thing happening with the QA. So I was, I was like, well, you need to look at this. I call that a, a health rating sometimes. How often, uh, how, how often are your tests running green? Uh, what percentage of your tests are, are because at some level, and, and people would say, well, well, those tests are failing, or there's a there's a, a, a test that's failing a lot, right? But you go in and they say, well, that's because the developers didn't fix the bug. I said, well, why are we running the test, right? Why we, why do we if we know that you know until that bug is fixed, you know, and it's kind of the feeling I think sometimes it's like, oh, if we keep running that test over and over again and it keeps failing, that'll like force the uh, the devs to like fix it, which uh, I, that's never I've never seen that happen actually. Has anyone seen that happen where they just fix it because it keeps running red? But yeah, you've seen it. Okay, great. So, and that's good because if it works, it does. But a lot of times it doesn't. A lot of times when I work with people, they're like, well, let's keep running it because the devs aren't looking at it because there's so many false alarms and other issues. Right? And that's what we want to get to. We want to get to a point where they are respecting the outputs and wherever the whole team wants to keep things green. That's why, to me, that health rating is so important. Is, is it shows the health of the whole project. And if you say, well, Oh, that's an environment issue. Oh, that's a config issue. Oh, that's a, that's uh, some other issue. And it's like, well, as if, and, and when someone's saying that, they're not thinking about, uh, they're not thinking of it from this kind of check ops perspective. They're thinking of it as just, well, my code's good. There's something else out there that's some kind of operational issue that uh, is the problem. So. Um, and of course, speed becomes the big one too, because, because if you have a lot of tests that take a long time, it's really inconvenient, right? So we try to figure out how do we run things horizontally, how do we horizontally scale so we get a, a faster turnaround time. And that's really what the speed, sometimes it's getting your tests to run faster and not putting lots of long, hard-coded sleeps in it, right? Because that, that, that wastes time. Um, but it's also getting, getting it that way. And it's also being judicious, because once I found, if you focus more on the reliability and the speed, you actually realize that, that you need to be smarter about the coverage. Just adding test cases all the time may not be the right thing to do. And in fact, sometimes you want to start subtracting test cases because you're realizing you know, what we want is a reliable signal. We want a reliable signal if this is good or bad. And having lots of tests, especially if, there's a lot, if many of them are unreliable, is actually going to undermine our ability to do that. And so this is the types of reliability that uh, that I've seen come up with this. And uh, you know, you have the reliability of the test, of the framework of the environment. To me, these are all part of the QA role now, or the whatever the role you want to call it, the automation role or the, the check ops engineer, uh, if you want, uh, is to figure out how do I how do I take care of all these things. And this is one of the reasons why, you know, in the old software as a product world, uh, I would install the software myself. Uh, frequently, and I, I knew how to do that. So on top of that, that was still part of um, what I was testing because we would ship something that other people should be able to install. But as we've moved to the software as a services, it becomes harder and harder to figure out how to install these things, and the the configuration is so much more complicated. It gets kind of, and we just kind of live with what we have. So that's that's what we we have at uh, at HomeAway. We have you know a bunch of test environments, and. and People are like, well, that's an environment issue. We're seeing an environment issue again. And I feel like we have to own that. I feel like we have to say that's, our, that's something we have to make right just, just as, as, as the developer. Like we're, we're just kind of like the developer who's saying it works on my machine. Oh, well, my tests work on my machine, right? Well, uh, we, you know, we want them to work on everyone's machine. That's, we want them working in, in, in our, all of our test environments. So, so that's kind of the ideas I have. I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Um, I've given this talk several times, and this is the first time I've never been interrupted 17 times by the time I got here. So you're either very tired because, or just half awake because it's early in the morning, or just very polite. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, could we get a, a mic or something for questions? Do we have any questions or any comments on this?
Yeah. Okay, the question is is checking versus testing, right? And the what? Yeah. So I think the idea of saying let's distinguish between testing and checking was originally introduced as a way of um, saying, you know, we don't want to be just manually going through checklists and doing things that could easily be automated. Let's think about all of the things that are involved in coming up with a good test plan and a good test strategy, and we're going to give that word testing. So the, the, the terminology, I think, comes from Michael Bolton. Uh, and I think it was intended as a way to help uh, glamorize the tester role, especially the manual tester role, and to kind of dismiss uh, some of the, uh, the role of, of, of automation, or just saying, you know, don't be, was saying, you know, don't just, because you know, some places may, may, may do this where you have just a, a script, a manual script that says, here's the things you need to go through, right? And then the thinking is, well, that's not really a good use of a human being's time, right? We want to automate that and have the human doing it, the exploratory testing, uh, thinking of what are the risks, what are the scenarios, coming up with new ideas about what can be really effective on that. Um, and what I, did recently, I realized let's, I can flip that around. And, and although this terminology was originally introduced as a way of of kind of diminishing, uh, and it was it was kind of like, well, checking is things that can just be automated, so let's automate them, as if automation were somehow really easy, as if we could just say, okay, well, if it's a script, we could just write the steps. But I, I don't know for me, I've been doing automation for a long time, and I find it difficult. I find particularly getting a reliable tests to be a difficult job. Because you go in, you get the false alarms, right? It comes through. Um, there's 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 delays on the network for some reason. Maybe you're testing on a system that's under load at certain points. So you're getting a slower response time, so your tests start failing. So getting checking to be reliable to me, I realized is actually a difficult but honorable role. And so that's what I'm trying to say is saying let's embrace this idea of checking. Let's not accept okay, you're just doing some checking. You're just doing this easy thing. Uh, I, I don't see it that way. Thank you. And can you go to your last slide? Sorry? The reliability slide. So test reliability, do you have any uh, tools to measure um, the reliability of test or test framework or environment? How to uh, measure it? Can, pe can people hear his question? Can you please speak into the mic? Okay. Uh, so you are talking about reliability right here. Mm -hmm. Test reliability, test framework reliability, as well as environment reliability. How do we measure it? Do you have any tools or anything you know well, about it? What I can measure easily is reliability, right? Because all I can I can measure test reliability by just looking every time I run a test suite. I can say what percentage of the tests are red and what percent are green, what percent passed and what percent failed, right? And what I what what I've been pushing for this, I've been calling this a health rating or a health check. And um, and the the problem is that number includes all of these. Yeah. Right. How do you like um, segregate in a? No one can hear you. Uh, how do you segregate? You know, we know that test failure happens due to either test framework or due to a test or an environment failure. How do you like? M m how do you distinguish between them and present it to stakeholders? So to me. As a check ops engineer, I don't really care what the problem is, right? To me, it's our job to make sure that, that like, I don't, I, I hear what you're saying. You're saying, how do I let them know what the source of the problem is, right? Yeah. Um, I think for me, we need to own all of them, and we need to say it doesn't matter. So it doesn't matter. And so what's, the reason we do this is because we say, well, I'm doing the tests, and someone else is the framework, and someone else is in charge of the environment. And I want to figure out whose finger, who I should point my finger at, right? That's the problem. The problem is the question that says, which of these is it, and who do we point our finger at? The answer, I think, is that we have to own all of this. That if, as a tester, as an automation engineer, if my framework is the source of reliability, then I need a better framework. If my environment is the source of reliability, I need a better environment. And I have to own these all. 
Now, obviously, on a case-by-case -case basis, we can figure out what the problem is, right? We can go and we look at it. But when I come back and say, oh, it's a timing issue, that doesn't answer this question, right? So we have to go through. The goal of saying, so, so we have to get this number high of all of it, and that means that we need to systematically own all of the things that are keeping it below. That's, that's, that's my claim I'm trying to say here. Hi. Uh, I don't want to sound more of a, it doesn't want to sound uh, more of a philosophical question, kind of a, this thing, but again, it's related to the, uh, you know, what does the money want, you know, thing that you touched upon. So why don't you throw more light, you know, how do we really correlate our work to the, you know, business, I mean, the value addition to the business, uh, you know, if you, if you can just elaborate more, that'll be helpful. Saying how can we be more effective at helping the business? Yeah, no, yeah, basically, you know, not being more effective, but you know, how do we really, you know, understand the the impact that our day-to-day -day work creates, uh, you know, to the business? So basically, you know, just for everybody's benefit, you know, if you can more elaborate on that. Yeah, I I think part of this means we need to be talking to the people we're working with about what they want, and we need to be looking at it. I. I th think it's easy to get into a system where we feel like, okay, it's my responsibility to own the quality or it's my responsibility to write these tests. Uh, a lot of times I see, I, I think this is part of the reason why I think, you know, a lot of what I'm pushing for is that we need to focus more on reliability and less on coverage. And I think that's because that's normally what the money wants. But that's, you have to ask. You have to, you have to go and, and talk to the people you're working with and say, okay, you know, do we want, right now I have a test suite, it's got 50 tests in it, and every night five of them fail for random reasons. Should I be writing more tests, or should I be trying to figure out how to make this more reliable? I, I think it's a question you can ask the people you work with, and, and they will tell you. And I think this is partly also about us, you know, as we work with the managers. What do they want? What are, they, what are their expectations for it? I think sometimes what happens is people get frustrated, right, and they say, well, I don't know how to make this more reliable, right? My skills... Uh, are set up so that I can write a lot of tests, and so I'm going to focus not on what the money wants, but on what I'm good at, right? And I think that's that's the problem is that we have to figure out. Well, do I, you know, maybe I need to learn more. And this is why I, this is why personally I feel like I have to be more involved in DevOps and I have to be more of an operations guy because I'm realizing that in my environment, in the situation I'm in. That's what they want. They want reliable test suites. They want test suites that give a clear signal. Uh, you know, we have cases, and I look at these things where the, you know, I have a test suites, and we have we we have this a lot where they're between 90 and 95 percent um, green every day, right? Which means there's just, it, 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 and I think we accept that as QA engineers, but as an operations guy, that's horrible. Right? In operations, you're looking you know, 99% uptime. You're looking for very high levels of reliability. And I think in QA, we accept a pretty uh, poor reliability. Um, and I think part of it's because we just say, well, I don't know how to fix that. Or this framework, it doesn't, you know, it's not going in there. Or we say, oh, well, there's a, and like I said, there's these timing issues. I, you know, another thing I didn't put in the slide here, but I think it's kind of related, is, is the environments. And, and I think part of what's facilitating this is to move into the cloud. And the ability and making it easier for us to build environments again. I think there was kind of a period where, you know, I said, you know, 10 years ago or so when we were, when I could install the entire uh, software stack, the entire application uh, on a machine that I had. Um, so it was kind of within my scope to own all of that. And then as we get this more complex architecture, I can't do that anymore, right? And so what's happened is now I'm having to depend on on a team server, and that's what happens is, well, there's things that are, and, and, and I've just kind of ex allowed myself to not own the, the whole environment anymore. And so I'm feeling this is a challenge for myself as much as for, for the rest of you. How can we get back into that? How can we say, how do we build that? And I think the cloud is one way to get there where we say, okay, now I can spin up my own environments again, and I don't need, um, I don't need to always just use some environment that some other people put together that's pretty good but not great. Does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, I've been listening uh, to a lot of this about the merging QA with ops, tech ops. Uh, the thing is, I'm a QA, not an automation tester. Do you really think we should be learning a new skill, add another responsibility to our already big group of responsibilities? Because we need to know front end code, back end code, business, um, database. Do you really need? Sh do you really think we should add another responsibility? It's a good question. I I think that um, I think that's the challenge we face because uh, this responsibility of owning the environment and of take uh, of taking away. And like I said, I think you said that you know we had all these other things we have to own, but I also feel like uh, we've let go of some responsibilities. That's why I was talking about the A/B testing. I feel like I used to feel like usability testing was part of my role as a QA. I mostly don't anymore. I mostly find that you know I look at something and I'll say, well, you know, this doesn't look the greatest to me, and I may be able to suspect it, but I, I'm realizing we have a, a methodology that can help us really find out whether this is going to confuse people or not, and whether it's going to make sense to them. So that, to me, is an example of one piece of responsibility that has moved out. Uh, and so that's, that's one of the things that I'm encouraging us to let go of, so that we will have more space to own in some of these operation, operational abilities. But you're right. It's, it's, it's taking on that role. But the problem is, if we don't, then what happens is, you know, it's the two questions. It's what's the money want, but it's also what's the business value of what I'm doing. And if the value of what I'm doing is being undermined by things that I'm just going to accept and say, well, I can't, you know, there's a timing issue. I don't know what the issue is. You know. <coughs> That's why it's failing. It's not a real bug. Uh, then, um, then I don't feel we're, we're going to be able to move to, it, to, a new, to a new level. And I guess for me, maybe for you it's different, but like I said, I've been looking at this for a long time when I felt like, okay, the commercial tools were crap. I said, let's use open source as a way of making better tools. So personally, that's how I've always been. Now, was that, now, does everybody take on that responsibility? No. But I think that that's, as a community, something we have to move to to figure out how can we own the, uh, the reliability, the health of our test suites so, and, and making sure. Because the value of our work is the value of the signal that they provide. And so I think we have to accept that. If we want to accept, OK, you know, we're just going to accept a certain amount of back-level uh, noise in what we have here. Maybe that's what we have to do. Maybe we're in a situation where that's what we have to do. For me, I'm, I'm trying to find ways to get through there. Um, and personally, do you think it's better for a, a QA or a person working in IT to have a lot of skill sets, to know a little about a lot, or to know a lot about just one particular skill set? They should have a lot of what tests? Um, if you think a person should have a lot of knowledge about uh, um, a lot about like a lot of skill sets, for example, QA, um, you know, backend code, JavaScript code, anything, or just focus on one thing, for example, automated testings or hops or something like this. I mean, it's personal opinion. I I, I think in general, what we've seen is that the skills that we're expecting for people are broader. You know, it, it used to be, I would say 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we would have, okay, I'm a database programmer. I'm a front end programmer. I'm a middleware programmer. And there, we accepted a lot more specialization than we accept today. I feel like in general, everybody, not just the QA, are being expected to have, you know, what they call the T-shaped skills and to have a broader understanding of the different pieces they're working with. And then there are certain areas where they can go deep. So I think that's true of everybody, and I think that needs to be true of QA as well. Do you have another question? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, in the back. Yeah, I have a, uh, I have a question on uh, uh, DevOps. Yeah. Uh, like you mentioned, uh, uh, how QA can involve with uh, development and operations team. Uh, like how QA can make a difference for both the development team and the operations team separately. Like I, I wanna, uh, I'm trying to understand that with an example if you have, so that would be helpful. Okay. Um, I, 
you know, I worked, I worked with one team where there, we really didn't have the DevOps stuff, right? This was several, maybe five years ago. Well, even less than that. Um, and so it was still a, a, a mostly manual deployment process, right? And so it would be, uh, the, it would go into, a, we'd have a staging environment, we'd manually put in that environment, QA would check it out. There was a very, you know, we had a protocol of here's the testing that we'll do in this environment, make sure it's all ready to go. And then once that had happened, we would give it the thumbs up and then it would be put into, um, you know, and then it'll be manually deployed into production, right? So that's, that's your pre, that's not DevOps, right? That's just your kind of traditional approach. And um, in that role, right, I, I, there was a lot of pressure and focus on the QA. Uh, and that's why, I, that's why I said, you know, to me, the, uh, I realized, because at one point I was in, a, I was in an environment uh, like that, and we did not have the ability to do rollbacks. So, uh, and we had a, a really big QA team, and, and it was clear to me at one point that the money, that the company was spending a lot of money on QA. And I realized, well, that was part of the reason why was because, because uh, it was such a big risk doing a deployment. And that was, so we were part of the way of mitigating that risk, right? Then I worked with other teams where um, it was, either uh, easier to do a rollback or easier to do a patch, right? And so in those situations, there's less risk if there's, a fail, if there's a failure deployment because we can either pull it back or we can patch it and put it out quickly. And in those cases, uh, and this is what I've been seeing with some of the teams, is the QA people sometimes are getting mad because they're like, well, people don't care about us as much anymore, right? We're not as important anymore. And I think that's kind of true. Um, and so I, so I feel like what we have to do is we have to say, okay, how do we get uh, an embrace? Instead of saying, hey, you know, we need to have a formal handoff, what we need instead of saying is, like, how can we provide the tools? Again, this comes into, I, I, I want to go back to that original idea where, which, you know, I had years and years ago that we're creating artifacts that other people can use. How can we create a test suite? How can we create an automated system so that anybody can run it at any time and know reliably whether something is good or bad? And I want to get back into that world. And to me, to do that, that means we need to have the ability to easily spin up systems reliably, run the tests on them against a given code build, and then give accurate information uh, you know, using CI or whatever, saying here's what the problems are and looking at that reliability, that system. I think the traditional role where we have this manual automated testing and we have the automator who has to be there to interpret slows that down enormously. And so that's why I'm saying we have to pull, that we need to pull out of that. How can we, and the way we do that is by focusing, again, less on coverage, more on the reliability of the test, the environments, and learning all about it. This is, like I said, this is to me, where I think we need to go, I don't have all of this figured out uh, how we get there. Uh, that's part of what I'm here to, 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 to share. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Uh, morning. Uh, the question I had is more about the roles. You kind of answered in previous questions, but I want to more, be more specific on, you said there are two different roles as a QA engineer, as a test developer and the check off engineer. I want to know that where they, each fit in in the software development cycle. Like, as if I understand correctly, checkoffs engineer are mostly to make sure everything is working correctly. At the end, like everything is green. If I'm, I may be wrong, but and the test test dev engineer would be review all the failures. But who would be responsible for writing new tests, make sh and then fix it at the end? Like, how does both roles fit in in yeah. the ideal world? Yeah, that's a good question. So, I guess I don't see them as two different roles, but more as uh, an evolution. And I'm trying to evolve from being that test developer who's uh, focused on just writing tests to being, uh, just as in DevOps, the idea is that, um, it, I think of a traditional developer, right? You can say, well, there's the developer and there's the DevOps. But to me, DevOps is not a role. I know some people think it's a role. But to me, it's more of a philosophy. And in, in a DevOps philosophy, developers need to own and understand and get involved in operations of the systems that they're developing more than they used to. So this goes back to the question I had about you know, additional responsibilities. I think that's what 
developers who are embracing DevOps are doing is they're, they're embracing more responsibilities. And that's what I think when I say checkups engineer, I'm saying that test developer needs to also embrace more responsibilities in there. Now, maybe there are some different roles. Maybe we do still have some more traditional test developers, and we have some other people who are looking at broader. Uh, haven't really, th I I'm still figuring this out for myself and for my team, and this is something working out. So those are good questions. Do we have other questions? Hi. Uh, I want to know with your experience, what is the average lifespan of an automation test case? The average lifetime of an automated test case? Yeah. Like how long it we have it before we delete it? Or how long it's good? Uh, how long uh, uh, is the lifespan of a test case uh, when we have to retire the test case? I I'm confused about the question. How long do we have the test case? Like, how long does it take to run? Yeah, uh, every sprint we have to uh, uh, retire some test cases. So, uh, with your experience, uh, what is the average lifespan of a test case would be? You said that every sprint you have to retire some test cases. Yeah. Is that because of something I said, or is that something that you want to do? <laughs> you know, I just want to know your uh, opinion on that, with your experience. I'm not sure if I understand your question, but let me say something here. Maybe this will uh, take care of it. Um, I find that it's easier for automators in general to write new test cases than to analyze the suites they have. And I feel like that's part of what we have to look at. And we have to look at like a time budget. We have to say, you know what, we need to run. Uh, we want to be able to provide feedback quickly to our teams. And so we want that to be within a certain amount of time. And usually we have different test suites. We have some test suites that run in five minutes or 15 minutes or an hour, right? But uh, like I, I recently was checking our, 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 our results. And we had a lot of test suites that took between two and five hours to run. I thought that was kind of crazy. So because that means your ability to improve and develop and whatever, to me, I want to break those into smaller pieces. And then I want, we want to look at, OK, is there duplication happening in those tests? That's, that's the thing that, that I think is a hard problem. I don't have an easy solution to it. But it, you know, do we need to test every scenario every time? right? Um, what's the right level of coverage? And I think part of it, it comes back to the signal. Like, if, you know, what are the tests that we really need. And so I, I've been trying to push teams to just focus on getting a green smoke test, right? Let's, what's, a, what's a subset of the tests we have that we can get to run very quickly and very reliably? And then, and, and then add to that and work from there. Um, so I'm still thinking of different ideas about how to get there. Um, that's, that's one of the ideas I have. This, I'll quickly this, jump in. Uh, right. There's actually a talk from Julian next after this, where he's going to talk about using analytics from real field to actually determine which, text, uh, which tests you should still keep and which tests you can actually do away with. So I would recommend having a look at that talk. It happens right after this. Thank you. Yes? There are companies where uh, they have separate uh, automation framework team and test scripting keywords are different from the automation framework keywords. Right. So if we cannot uh, distinguish between this, uh, all the factors, so how do you know where the problem is occurring? Well, I think we can distinguish between it. I, I think the question that he asked before was whether we can measure it. I said I think that's difficult to measure, uh, you know, but I think on a case-by-case -case basis, we can look at the failures and we can say, okay, is this a failure in the test or is this a failure in the framework? Yeah, one other thing was that uh, if we have to own all of those, then, uh, I mean, the automation framework is not built by the scripting team. So why you should own those things in, when you move into DevOps? Right, so to some degree, you have to have a one-team philosophy or none of this works. 
So you've got to be able to say, as a team, we have to own these problems. And if you have two separate teams, and this is doing this, then you're going to have exactly this type of reliability problems, right? If I'm, if I'm in charge of building a framework and providing it to a bunch of people, and that's a job I've had many, many, many times my, over my career, so I understand that role. But if my job isn't reliability, but just to give them a framework with features and then they own the reliability, it's going to fail, right? So we have to have a, a, a cooperative relationship where, and, and in my view, the framework people should be finding ways of making everything more reliable, right? If you're providing general code for other folks, that's uh, part of your responsibility. And if they're saying, well, you know, um, and, and you could get some finger pointing in this sometimes, but the point is someone's got to have some vision about how we're going to get through this or, or it's not going to work. So I uh, like that triangle where you said, okay, um, reliability and speed are more important com compared to the coverage. So even I support that, but uh, I want to know your experiences. So uh, I tell you a situation. So we are in a situation where uh, we have lot of we have to add lot of end to end or uh, test cases to increase our coverage because we have uh, almost nil uh, unit integration test. So developers uh, have a mentality of saying, okay, the testing is the test just QA job. So uh, they should be writing the test. So in order to have a coverage, we have we write lot of test cases. And I met a lot of other people also. They also have uh, experiences that uh, they have very few unit tests. Uh, and most of their test cases are end to end or uh, UI test cases or API test cases. So uh, I want to know from your experiences uh, if you have experienced such a situation uh, in your experience, like 20 years' experience. And then um, did you uh, lead efforts to uh, do a transformation from uh, basically inviting the pyramid from uh, pushing the test to lower layers and then getting more unit test coverage up compared to the end-to-end -end test coverage. That's, I completely agree with what you're saying. That's exactly what you have to do. Because what's, what's the, the problems with these reliability to some degree, if you have a large number of end-to-end -end UI tests, you're going to have to accept a, that there's, you're going to have reliability issues. And if you don't have reliability issues, you're going to have speed issues, right? That's absolutely true. And, and so what you're saying, I've already seen several people talk about the pyramids and how you want to move down, down more unit tests, more integration tests. I completely agree. That's that's what I that's what I am also working on as well. I think that's part of the that's a, a key part of the solution is you have to do that. Uh, and and these things I'm talking about, I think, are just more reasons to do that. So, are there any like uh, some uh, from your experiences, uh, some approaches, some way we can actually drive those? Things? Because it's hard. Like the developers who are used to like working the way that okay, I'm just writing the code, you test it out. So, how do you drive those uh, things down? So, do, can you share some tips or some experiences on that? Um, yeah, I don't have. Uh, I don't have. I, I think we have to do that. I think we do it by by working with the developers by by crossing boundaries by not uh, by saying okay as a team we need more integration tests as a team we need more unit tests and then we do it um, I agree it's a challenge it's a challenge for me this is something that I this is this is part of my daily job is to figure out the ways to do this and I don't have any magic bullets for that um, but I think these are more reasons why we have to do that because otherwise we're just going to be in a situation which is very frustrating for for a lot of people Hey Brett, um, just okay. Brett is going to be around. Yeah, so I'll be around to chat. Uh, thank you for your questions. I really appreciate them, and um, and uh, and I will be around for more conversation. So I'll I'll right. give this to you to to pass on. Thank you. Thanks, Brett.